All right, so uh, let us begin. Uh, I want to begin really quickly with a history of culinary arts. Unlike any other history of culinary arts you've probably ever uh, seen, it's also unlike any other history of culinary, culinary arts lecture I've ever given in the past. Don't worry, I'll give you the slides. Uh, ask Christia, that's her job. Um, so, to begin with the history of culinary arts, I wanted to start with a very, very important concept. And that is the concept of having a vision. Do you know what you want in your life? It's a very difficult question to answer, isn't it? I thought I had it multiple times in my life. And then later I found it was a dead end. You know, and then sometimes you invest so much time only to find out, hey, this is a dead end thing. I decided five years ago. Uh, so what do you want in your life? It's a very powerful thing, knowing where you want to go. And you know now at my age, it's only at my age that I realize that really what I want in life is to, is to help other people, through edu serve other people through education and food, which are my two areas of gifting. No? So having vision, while you go about your daily tasks, while you go about your daily days, having vision, I would say, is your number one secret agenda always. It's a discovery. You know, it doesn't fall on your lap. It comes through failures, trials, and etc., etc. Because nothing is really as powerful as vision. Diba? Sight is for the eyes. Nakikita natin. So that's why we're so much into social media. It excites us. But there's nothing more distracting than your Instagram feed. There's nothing more distracting than TikToking and Facebook. Because uh, it's, it gives you stimulus and other people are now controlling your thoughts instead of you controlling your own thoughts. Um, there's a growing amount of people who are deleting those apps from their phone. I joined three weeks ago, most productive three weeks of my pandemic life. So sight is for the eyes, but vision is a function of the heart and the mind. Diba? The eyes show you what is, but vision shows you what could be. And sorry for this. I'm uh, my kids are gamers, so I love these gaming characters. My eldest he draws cards of different characters with powers. And my kids may like cards, trading cards. Stigyan. All right. So the wonderful thing about vision uh, is it's seeing a glimpse of your purpose, what you're intended to do. It's something that we find. Some people never find it because they don't bother to look. And uh, I believe that uh, you joining culinary arts class is definitely a step in the right direction. I'm not si being a chef is not for everyone, but culinary education does not mean you should only be a chef. Huh? Before they would tell you that. And so many people would tell you what a chef is. Right? You have to have a restaurant, you have to have this. Yes and no. Uh, people ha can make a wonderful life for themselves and help people, serve people, uh, make a career, build a business, build something big, whether they're the restaurant chef or they're not. And now, with all the social media that you have, it's a wonderful place because um, uh, it opens up so many different opportunities and options for you, all right? And the nice thing about vision, uh, you know, it's not about an experiment. Eh? Once you know what your vision is, hello, come in, join us, join us. Uh, we already started the lecture, but you can, Madam, can you pull a table na lang? Or, sige, that's fine. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, so, vision and non, sorry, vision is non-experimentation. Diba? Once you know your vision, you don't experiment with life anymore. Some of you are maybe experimenting. That's fine, diba? We don't know. Eh. It's trial and error. Diba? So, I would like to start the history class with a little talk about the vision. Because if you're, not, if you're unable to see the significance of the past, how do you address the future? If I didn't have a past as a chef, would you believe anything that comes out of my mouth? No. Like, like you prob you're probably here because you know I, I've been through a lot. My, my career is quite... Uh, I has some milestones that have been hit. And then maybe from my experience of 20 plus years, 
I'm able to help you figure out what your path is. Diba? If I was just some guy with no past experience and decided, hey, you know what, I'll teach in culinary school, you, will you even go to class? No, it's our past that makes, that gives value to our future. Kaya, wag yung smolin ang past din yung. Never say lang. Dude, that's where you learn. But at the same time, I feel that if you're ashamed of your past, you'll never learn from it. Diba? If you attempt to hide it, put it in a baul, how do you learn from it? How do you then maximize what you're learning now in culinary arts so that you can make an impact in the future? It's very difficult. Yeah? So, uh, learn from your past. Don't be ashamed of it. The mistakes give the best lessons. Who's born, who's born perfect anyway? Who dies perfect anyway? Huh? Technically, we're all failures already. Doesn't that, doesn't that take a load off your shoulders, diba? Right? So if we're all failures already, in that sense, maybe all we can do now is succeed with everything that we do that's good. Wonderful. Ah, I can breathe. Diba? Right? So anyway, that's a mindset. It's, uh, it's not fact. That's a mindset. Uh, vision is a fact, though. We need a vision. And so I hope all of you, while you learn to cook, learn to bake, learn to be chef, think about what it is that your vision and purpose is about. Because huh? it's all different. Every one of you. It's as different as the fingerprints on your thumbs. So let's begin. History of culinary arts through my eyes. Uh, this is a little bit... Uh, I decided to tackle this in a very philosophical way that resembles 10,000 years of human existence in one hour. <laughs> Good luck, chef. Right? <laughs> All right, so, uh, so I hope you will appreciate it. And uh, let's start from this slide, which I call the Garden of Eden. You know, humans before, humans, what is human anyway? You know, humans were 200,000 years old or 100,000 years old as a species. Uh, the 200,000-year-old version had a larger brain, but how do we say this? The digestive system was less efficient. Why? Why, Chef? Why? You keep asking me why. I like the whys. Why? It's because they gathered food. That's why it's the Garden of Eden. Right? It's about picking food, berries, apple. Right? I wonder who decided that you could eat the coconut. Must have been maybe a couple of thousand years. <laughs> I was like, what is that? And they bite into it. It's like, ah, oh, terrible, right? But uh, eventually, maybe the coconut we was used to murder someone. It opened and wow, there's food inside. Anyway, that's, that's a total joke. But uh, we were foragers initially. And uh, as we foraged, more we foraged, we, know, we knew where to find the fruit trees. Because it's all about food. Eh? What you're eating now is food. What happened art none? It was about necessity and survival. Uh, but then it helped, how do you say this, change and evolve our digestive system, which makes us what humans are today. Uh, we're able to eat fruits with no problem, vegetables. Okay? And uh, so it's a blessing. We're blessed with this bountiful world, world of food where you can eat uud, diba? Anong kinain mo? Woodworm. Diba? Madame can have her hard-boiled egg in the morning, diba? and then the people in the mountains can just go pick whatever fruit they pick and eat it and survive. So fine, that's great. Uh, and then, uh, what is the significance that it has on chefs? Is that chefs are now the ones that actually rule over this produce. And when I say chef, this, in this particular sense, it's a very... Uh, it's, 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 a, it's an idea of someone that actually takes food and makes it something else. So we have this bountiful amount of produce to choose from. Chicken, beef, pork, gulay, ampalaya, kokra, all of these things. Beans, mais, diba? And uh, it's quite a lot to take in. Can you imagine all of that is for me to use? As a chef, as a cook, as a person that peddles food, diba? And uh, I like the story of, cre of Genesis kasi... There's a serpent, uh, diba? There's a snake that tells Eve, hey, eat the apples. If you eat the apples, you will be like God, and your eyes will open. That's the story of Genesis. And the reason why I add it in here 
is because as early as the blessing comes, you have the blessing of this wonderful world of culinary arts, but as early as the blessing comes, there will always be forces that try to misguide you from what? Your purpose, your intent, your gift. You know what those forces are? Everything else. I say your purpose, intent, only you know that. I don't know that. I cannot tell you this is what you should do. Absolutely not. It's not my job. It took me 40 years to know what I should be doing 100%. Because I was always in doubt. But then what I noticed, the more I did something, oh, mali, it's not. Parang, if I went to a certain area, my doubt would grow. And what I told myself, oops, this is not probably for me. I'll shift. Whenever I went to a certain area, wow, it's like progress, success. I realized that if I were a fruit tree, it depended where I planted myself, was there growth or not. Yeah? Significant discovery for me in my life. And then now I, I gauge everything by, is there growth in what I'm doing here? And if there is, that's my area. So, hope you keep that in mind. Huh? But then there are forces now that are misguiding us. Um, I believe social media is one of those major distractions. Because who curates social media? No one. No one. Yeah? Who says that it's right? But then, tell me, if you give social media to your nephew, niece, son, daughter, who's six years old, well, aren't they going to absorb it as truth and fact? They do it. It's fact. Right? So can you imagine the power of that? It's someone who is not purely developed. And uh, so the reason why I say that is that social media, that's one. We also have forces, other people telling us what we can and cannot do. That's another serpent. Right? Someone who's trying to misguide us. Sometimes it's the people we love. Sorry, sometimes. Often. <laughs> when I wanted to become a chef, everyone was like, what the fuck? <laughs> Mom, dad, cousin. A lot of people just don't care. 1999, who in the world was chefing then? Okay ka lang, Rob? Someone asked me. Diba? But I did it anyway. I took a risk. You had to take a risk. And I had been, taken many stupid risks before that. But this was the risk that rewarded me the most. And then as I came back, the serpent comes in my life again. But here I am doing what I'm doing, spent so much money, spent so much time and effort. And then some people would tease me like, Gluto ka na lang. Now why don't you just cook? But I'm degrading my profession that I tried so hard two, and two years to actually gain just to enter it. So the reason I say this is, uh, yes, you are blessed, but with every blessing comes a curse. And not that amount of curse. I would say just opposition. But don't focus on the opposition. That's what I'm trying to say. There's always opposition. Hear it. See if it rings true. Am I really being... Am I really this thing that this person says I am? Do I have a portion of that in me? If there really is, hey, maybe it's time to address it and remove it from your system if it doesn't serve you. Pero if it's not true... They're, everyone is entitled to their own opinion. You don't have to accept it. All right? So another thing is about the blessing in the Garden of Eden, that being a chef, all the decisions you make, you know, you know how Adam and Eve made the wrong decision? They ate the apple, right? They weren't supposed to eat. Some people say it was a trap. But there are so many other blessings. There's only one thing that they didn't want to do. As an adult, we have to say no to things. Aren't we adults? If we say yes to everything, do you think you'll still be alive? In a week's time. <laughs> no. You probably have to. You know, your family would disown you. You probably have your chopped head, your head chopped off. I don't know. But basically, we're adults. We have to make decisions because not everything is the right decision for us. And uh, that's why I really like this, uh, this analogy of the Garden of Eden. Because as adults, we make the decision that shapes our lives. There are consequences and there are laws. Right? If you decide that the law of gravity doesn't exist, and you jump off a building. Guess what? But you're a piaya at the end. <laughs> well, you're a piaya at the end of it. So we have these laws that we work with, and if you're able to identify the more laws and use them properly, they work for you. They work for you. And speaking of laws, I love this. I love the fire. 
the law of fire and combustion. Huh? Wonderful. I believe fire was discovered 30,000 years ago. I could be wrong with my numbers. That's not the point of money. Okay? And the reason why fire was the light of the world for culinary education was that it helped humans from picking... Dude, how many calories in a berry? One? <laughs> One calorie in a berry, right? Yeah, right? And then, uh, I mean, if you cook the egg, it goes bad fast right? once it breaks. Or, but anyway, fire led us to consuming more calories. There was evidence about 30,000 years ago that uh, were they Neanderthals? Correct me if I'm wrong, huh? but that's not my, we're not making a point of human anthropology here. It was uh, that group 30,000 years ago, they found evidence of mammoths, these giant elephants with horns that you see only in cartoons these days, they're extinct already. Uh, they found mammoths in a pit. And so they, they would cook. Uh, yeah, lechon basically, a giant lechon, the biggest lechon you could ever, wow. Must have been potentially good if we had that today, diba? Right? But then, back then, probably they didn't have salt yet at the time or seasonings. Uh, maybe they did, who knows, no? But uh, definitely they didn't have our tak tak tak. They didn't have aji sarap and, and uh, ajinomoto and nor seasoning and all these delicious things that make our daily lives yummy and our pants tight. <laughs> right? So fire was the light of the culinary world and it's because of fire that there was an increase of calories in this thing called man, human. Right? And this human person now could cook and smoke, which was a preservation technique. So guess what happened? Evolution happened, they became better humans. Less time looking for berries and grapes and, and trying to figure out if the coconut is actually edible or not. Right? Imagine the first person looking at the coconut. I love coconuts, especially pag malamig yung juice. Oh, sarap, sobra. Sa ato, sabado pa lang ngayon, pwede cheat date po pala. Can't wait for that, but I enjoy giving this class. Uh, so, it could be said, no, that uh, it's because of cooking that humans evolved. That's why I love, I love, it's so romantic. Uh, this whole cooking thing, it's just, it's so romantic to me. Uh, so, cooking allowed human ancestors to spend less time on the foraging, Chewing, digesting, things became more efficient. Literally, biologically in their bodies. Imagine the whole day, instead of looking for food, now you at bored, diba? Now they could start to chill. Di pa nila alam yung word na yun, pero pwede na sila mag-chill. Diba? So Homo erectus developed talaga more efficient, trap, and enable a larger brain growth. Diba? All because of the law of heat transfer and coagulation that was discovered. And if I can go back to your vision, the vision, your purpose, it's already inside you. Eh. Fire was always there, naman, diba? It was just discovered. So it was planted already for us to use. We just had to discover it. So like fire, discovering fire, I hope that you discover these little sparks in you. Probably today, maybe with a failure, maybe with a success, so that you can actually ignite that fire and it can light up what your purpose and what your vision in this world is. I am here to help you. You can talk to me anytime. You can ambush me. If I'm on the way, you just can't talk to us when we're cooking, obviously. But uh, it's a fun thing to watch. So after the fire, thousands of years later, people started getting smart. Right? Maybe a seed fell and they saw, hey, these seeds actually grow. Pook, seeds. A oh, plant came from the seeds. Ha! Huh. That's the time that a wonderful thing happened in the history of culinary arts. It's actually agriculture, but I just connect the two because it's so connected. It's the domestication of plants and animals. Right? It's the use for human purpose. This was amazing. You know what all humans have been asking for the longest time every day? Anong pagkain? Ano ulam? What's for dinner? Di ba? No, until this day, ha? Di ba? Kahit may TikTok dyan, magpapost kayo, TikTok post. Kaya! Anong pagkain? <laughs> Di ba? Hane! Ano luto mo? Di ba? What's for dinner? Um, 
So that question was very wonderful when domestication came because now we had more options. Eh? We were able to domesticate our own crops, uh, our own seeds, later animals. Goat was one of the first things that were ever domesticated. Uh, and sheep. You know, the sheep are apparently the dumbest animals in the world. Uh, because they just follow whoever's in front of them. That's, that's why you can herd sheep. Do you know that? Basically, they're looking at the butt of the sheep in front of them. Sinusunod lang nila. Tinitinan lang nila yung puwet. Tapos para silang... Those games na ano, dumadami kayo habang nag Anyways. So anyway, domestication happened. No? So what's for dinner? Diba? Seeds, grains. Later on, goat. Later on, after learning how to do goats, they you know, start to become cattle. Uh, don't get me started on the political vegan argument, please. If not for goats and meat, humans would not have evolved so fast. We would have been foraging still, planting. Diba? And uh, so there was a domestication of food. Big deal. Diba? Big deal. We started having control over this blessing and bounty that was the Garden of Eden of food that was bestowed upon us. Diba? And after that, we started making covenants. Not anymore with God, but with sometimes with God, sometimes with other people. Uh, so a covenant is a binding agreement. And the reason why I share this is because um, as a chef, we need to be very aware of cultural and dietary requirements of people. Diba? We, we cook, we produce. All your kababayans in Bahrain in the Middle East, they know what halal is. Your kababayans in Jerusalem, they know what kosher is. Yeah? Your kababayans in the hospitals, they know what a diet is for cancer, the diet for diabetes, the diet for whatever. And your kababayans in TikTok, oh, they also know what their diet is para mas dumami yung views, followers, likes, ta comments, di ba? So you see, it's a covenant. Food is extremely personal thing. Di ba? The way that we see food is that, hey, it's, uh, it says who I am, what social class I am in. Hmm? Sometimes, may, oftentimes the age, maturity level. If you don't believe me, You've never seen my children eat French fries. Uh, to them, it's like the most gourmet thing the world has ever invented. <gasps> and I'll tell you, it's potato corner. Pare mind blown sila, potato corner. Mind blown. Diba? But for an adult, it's like, okay, it's fries. Diba? We get excited with other things, whether it's sisig, sinigang, adobo, sushi, yada yada. But it's a covenant. And we identify very clearly with the food that we eat. And I can hear someone eating Food outside right now. You hear it? Yeah, yeah. She brought nilaga daw eh. Nilagang mu. Nilagang baka. So food is very personal. May I ask you this question then? Who or what influences the way that we cook and eat? Who influences, who influences the way that you cook and eat? So please, uh, mind that, mind that. Who influences, who influences the way you eat? Anybody? Kung sino man, ha? Huh? Parents, for sure, di ba? Yeah, kasi that's where you develop your taste. Ah. How wonderful. Friends also, and you start to go out and drink. Di ba? What's pulutan? That's the other question you once asked these days. Hindi na what's for dinner. Anong pulutan natin? Wow. I love sisig. I just eat it like once every three months. Well, anyways. <laughs> Chika lang. All right, so also part of culinary history is this wonderful world of discovery. Because as we grew with cattle, as we started having covenant, diba? thou shall not eat pork because it's unclean, um, and all these things. The Buddhists, the man, they, they, they have different beliefs. The Hindus have different beliefs as well. Uh, it's a covenant, but some covenants led to discovery. Some covenants that we had with food, concerning food led to wonder, and some led to innovation, amazing, really nice. But with discovery, wonder, and innovation, sometimes comes madness. The serpent is back. Uh -huh. I love it when it all connects. The you know, serpent is back. Here you are, excited with food. 
here you are making progress and here is a little distraction and you'll notice every time you make progress in your career in your business in your life whatever culinary arts means to you the serpent will show up try to distract you from your purpose huh it could be a magazine article and you feel like wow i'm the most famous they featured me and you start to develop this ego thinking that wow i'm, the, I'm so good oh wow what other what bigger lie is there than that there's no such thing as permanent success it's te it's as temporary and fleeting as you know what the perfect romance <laughs> it is diba i mean perfect romance you know papa ganyan yung mga girls with their foot oh my gosh so so mind you mind it mind it there's always a temptation to madness and one example in history is the corn, maize, you know? You know, at one point, at, for a civilization called the Mayans, the corn was huge. It was their currency, it was their status symbol, it was their offering to the gods, the Mayans. You can Google them. I don't know much about them, but it was about Mayans. Uh, they gave a lot of different technologies, but their madness drove them to sacrificing human hearts for better corn hearts. Yeah. yeah. Madness. Why lack of vision? They made shit up. <laughs> so let that be a reminder that with every success, this serpent is just slithering behind you, waiting for your weakest moment so that they can fuck you up. And I say that in a very good term. Because, you know, when you do boxing, you know what the coach always says? Number one, before you punch, always have your guard up. More often than not, first session, they'll say that. I promise you. I promise you they'll say that. Boxing ko sa gym. Boss, kailangan nakataas yung guard mo. And I say that the same. When you enter culinary arts, always have your guard up. Your biggest enemy is that ego inside you telling you you're hot shit. Okay? Let other people celebrate you. But don't relish it, enjoy it, but move on quickly. I have seen too many chefs get tempted by this thing called fame or success or who cooks better. Come on, who really does, right? How many lives do you serve? That's the bigger thing. Why? It's numerical. That when I found that out, I became... My vision became so clear. I said, when I was young, I was programmed to think, who's the better cook? Who's the better this? But I didn't make it because it's subjective. Subjective, lahat. So can you imagine a hundred people being subjective about one topic? It's a hundred different points of view, diba? Are there only a hundred chefs? Fuck no. There's so many in the world. It's gonna drive you mad. How about this instead? How many people are under your management? Mr. HR, how many customers do you serve? Or how many people do you help? Some, some of our other students in the other classes, they're taking culinary arts because they want to cook better for their foundation as, because they feed the poor. We're all different. For me to tell you, be a restaurant chef. You must have Michelin star. You must come out in world's best. You must do this, you must do that. You know what? Whoever tells you you must, serpent yan. You got your own thing going on. All I can do is give you the tools to find out what your fire is. And that is my job. No one can tell you what to do. So anyway, that's the madness. But wonderful madness sometimes also brings out also wonderful discovery. Like for example, the Chinese were recorded to be the first ones to chop off blocks of ice. They have, they have winter and to use it for cold storage. Uh -huh. Nice, ba? And I love that whole cold storage story. Diba? Because... Everyone was storing in ice until one time, one day someone decided, hey, let's build a freezer. There's always innovation, guys. Don't get stuck on your present. Live in the present. But can I ask you this? The present now, isn't that just already one second ago? Now it's five seconds ago? It's fleeting. So it's your vision, it's your direction that matters. All right, so uh, wonderful, no? Yeah, the Mayans and Maize with human hearts. Uh, beans were a very big discovery 
and uh, in the Americas, love beans, rice in China, okay, Southeast Asia. Dude, I love rice, man. <laughs> Just love rice. New bread, wonderful discovery. The, the first bread was a sourdough bread. Right? These are ancient techniques. Wonderful to get to know your ancestors by making sourdough. I haven't joined the trend, but I love eating it. Uh, noodles made again by the Chinese, but uh, Marco Polo will tell you otherwise. No? And the cheese were made by the Britons about three, 5,000 BC. So time of Christ, they were doing goat cheese. Cool stuff. If I wonder how it tasted back then, if it was actually good compared to now. Because now if you have milk from the grocery that's in a box, it's been pasteurized. Pasteurized, why? Because they got to kill all those bacteria that might be there because it's mass produced. Huh? But did you know this? Science law, the more flavorful something is, in vegetable-wise, fruit-wise, the more nutrition it has. When I found that out, I was like, fuck. Can you eat suha without salt? Melon without salt? Strawberry na masarap, solid, without salt or sugar? Yes, you can. Difficult to find, diba? Can you eat, chick you know, ulam without salt? It's kind of, it's difficult to eat, diba? So, uh, wow, it's like, wow, nature's got it all figured out for us. But then because we have the power to choose, whether we choose to eat from the, all the trees that are good for us or just one tree that's bad, the consequences of chef materializes in this real world. And as chefs, you will grow, will come to learn that you have a significant power on world food supply as a collective. So... Mind you, uh, think about that. I'm not going to tell you what to do. Just think about that. Uh, are you destroying a species or not? So that's for discovery, wonder, and innovation and madness. And I want to also talk about the first globalization 1.0. You know, the Romans are significant to my talk for culinary history because of their technology. Okay, the Romans were the rulers of the known whole world at the, at the time. Yeah, their number one technology was military technology, conquering other people. And then they would adopt and assimilate the cultures that they conquered. Uh, they brought roads. They made roads more efficient. That's why there's the saying, all roads lead to Rome. Uh, they learned from their slaves. Every time they conquered a civilization, they took them in as slaves. So literally, first globalization talaga to. And the reason why it's so significant, I believe, for chefs is uh, now that we live in globalization 2.0, and Elon Musk is building diba, Mars restaurant number one. Who's the chef there? Whoever is in that restaurant. That's, uh, it's just very important to know that. Uh, I think this slide, what I'm trying to say is that there's influences around us, and it's always changing. With every tribe the Romans conquered, culture changed because of an adaptation of their culture. So it's a good thing. It's neither good nor bad. Things change, basically. That's probably what this slide is like. Uh, things change. Change can be bad or good, depending on your language in your head. Right? A lot of us hate change, but change is the only constant. And uh, there's this myth, I don't know if it's factual, that the Chinese don't really have a character for the word crisis. Because a crisis comes often with change. Right? Instead, it's an opportunity. Wow. Right? Who makes money when the world's in crisis? China. Right? May mga nakulunga, di ba? <laughs> Why? Mindset. Di ba? They didn't even want to make a fucking character called crisis. Hey, you know what? Crisis, let's call it opportunity. I apologize for my mouth. I'm trying to work on it. I've been in the, chef, in the kitchen too long. So we tend, sometimes we can be quite Because The people I worked with were really something else back in the day. 
but I promise I'm working on it. Uh, but then, all roads, how is globalization happening today? How's it unfolding? It's tough. What happens in Ukraine affects our gas prices. Gas prices affect every other prices. Diba? All right, so that's super ancient history of food. I want to move in a little bit forward to something that we can relate to a little bit easier. But how was that? How was that for you? I mean, hearing those things. It's not usually in a culinary arts lecture, but I wanted to put it there. It gives value to what we do. I think it does. You know, to know that uh, from foraging to discovering a fire, we were, uh, it's like, hey, if you respect the law, Wow, you can even literally change a human being's digestive system, brain size. These are facts, huh? I'm not making this stuff up. <laughs> huh? Because of the food that we eat? Huh? Can I ask you, because of the food that they eat, how's America's waistline? How's America's health? No? My gosh, Australia also, wow. You know, when you're obese, my gosh, they're obese, crap. Yeah. You feel sorry for them, but then some of them don't have access to real food. Their whole life, they grow up to, with packed food in plastic. That's not food, diba? Right? Mm, it's edible. Can you imagine eating a Twinkie all the time? Or, or diba? Right? It's, it's not. Nagaraya is your nuts. Nothing against Agaraya. I love it with beer, diba? Right? But it's tough. But anyway, so we move forward. And I want to share with you a different look now. Now we move to something that is very relevant to us. And that is a culture of royalty, the aristocracy, the middle class, and also the peasants, the poor. All right? I get a lot of questions here. Why, chef? Why can't we make Filipino food as great as Japanese food? When I say great, popular. I think that's a better word. Because popular as a metric. Popularity is measured by the number of countries that have adopted it and the number of times you eat Japanese food in a week. Right? Agree? Diba? So let's stick to some facts and ob objectivity here. Okay? Why can't Filipino food be like Chinese food? Uh, I, of course it can, but uh, maybe the question that we need to ask is why is Chinese food so popular? Why is Japanese food so popular? Why is Italian pizza pasta so popular? Or Spanish food even, if you will. Thai, Vietnamese, yada yada. So I would have to attribute this to a culture of royalty. Because if you take a look at these nations and these cuisines, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Koreans, the, the Middle Eastern, the Royal Thai, Vietnamese cuisines, the French, it goes on and on. Uh, the French are, by the way, who invented the system of culinary arts that the Western world uses, which is what we teach two-thirds of the time here. All schools do. It's because, what do we attribute that? It's their royalty. Why? Royalty, they had so much time on their hands, they had these royal courts, they had all the resources at their disposal. They created the fashion of food. They created the fashion of clothing. They hired all the people for their art to make their commission on their art. So very much so, art comes from kingdoms, civilizations that have had royalty in them. Yeah? Emperor, Japanese, Chinese, emperor, Thai, Vietnamese, royalty. Thai until now, they have royalty. I ate Thai. I went to Vietnam once and met the chef, and he gave us Thai, Vietnamese royal cuisine. Wow! It's better than just four. It's more too than banh mi. Wow! Grabe. Diba? So we have uh, the, the royalties to thank. And in terms of the Philippines, the royalties that we had were the datus maybe, but then it wasn't so widespread. It wasn't that sophisticated. The next royalties we experienced were the royalties of Spain. But instead of helping us, they oppressed us. <laughs> so we were, quote unquote, the slaves for 300 years. So we don't benefit from that, uh, from having royalty, because we didn't have royalty that represented us. We had royalty that oppressed us. So it, in a way, but still, it affected the way we eat. So in that sense, adobo is a Spanish invention from vinegar. 
It's kabetche. And then later, it's a dawa. No, no. You think that? But nowhere else will you find adobo in Spain, or it's, it's escabeche, right? So we should attribute that to the past. That's why the learning of history allows you to really appreciate and value the past, so you can have better value for the future. So anyway, there's, there's this culture of royalty, and from royalty uh, came the rice, uh, not the rice, but there's always aristocracy. Royalty, you know what I royalty? Aristocracy is what people like to call the elite. About the elite of society. Um, so uh, the thing about aristocracy is they're not royals and they want to be. They think they're as good as the royals. So, uh, they're just, the royals are just lucky they were born in that, in that birthright. But aristocracy helped also pave the way to more fashion and to more art because uh, that's, how, that's how they one up each other. And guess what? All of them suffer from a lack of vision. They do. Why do you need to one up? Self worth is lacking. Why is self worth lacking? Too many serpents around you whispering in your ears. If I'm not good enough, yada yada. Uh, but it contributed to us being chefs. Because for, for society, having good food was, is, was and currently still is ultimate status symbol. Knowing how to eat, what to eat, the things that you can eat, they cannot eat. It's a big deal. And it happened back then, uh, as a case and example, from the royalties. Like in France, there was the period of Marie Antoinette. Uh, Marie Antoinette, I believe, was Austrian, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong. Uh, but then, at a time when France was so hungry as a nation, right? she was partying like there's no tomorrow. Right? Kim Kardashian mode. Pa rin siya. It's the original Kim Kardashian, Paris Hilton combined times 100,000. Right? So even when her country was having difficult you know, hunger, literal hunger, right? after all of these things we mentioned, they were having hunger. Uh, their lives were so miserable. But she would have these lavish balls that everyone heard about. And she would give all her cronies or her guests or her friends you get Ferrari, you get Ferrari, everyone gets Ferrari, ah! Marie Antoinette. Then they beheaded her, French Revolution. And when they beheaded her, chefs lost their jobs. The best chefs. Who hired them? The aristocracy. Because they got the cash for it. They got the estates. So we also have to thank the, from the royalties, you know, madness of royalties. I'm sure it's very maddening to do, if you're able to do whatever you want. It can be very maddening. Sometimes being, having limits is a wonderful box to be in. Uh, but anyway, there's the aristocracy. And then there's the working class. You know, the miners, the soldiers. Now it's us. Right? Maybe it's uh, the regular people that go to the office. Right? Take home paychecks, the working class. And when it comes to working class, if you notice, each class that's under is always looking to the next class. Aristocracy was looking up to the royals. Now we have the middle class looking up to the aristocracy. And uh, the foods that they eat, pretty much they try it so that they can emulate what the higher class is doing. Because as humans, don't we always want to elevate in our station in life? It's normal. We want progress. And sometimes social class is a very uh, pleasant, fun, and Instagrammable way to show our progress in life. So much so, that 9 out of 10 posts on Instagram is fake. Right? I just made a fake post yesterday. You know what my fake post was? I learned this from all the, the Instagram girls and boys. You know, I sa business class, business class picture, okay, balik ng economy. So anyway, I went to this Indian restaurant last night and there was this wonderful room. The name is Kashmir, it's here in BGC. You should check it out. When it comes to Indian, Kashmir and Indus do excellent, excellent Indian food in BGC. There's a room there. So, I can come in Sorry, sir. I can come in there. Sir, there's 12,000. Minimum. So, I can take a picture. I can take a picture. So, anyway, the reason why I say that is you're always trying to, to emulate. But uh, it, it's quite difficult because if it's fake emulation, then that's, that's like serpent with a speakerphone. Right? It's like completely misguiding you. Thinking that, wow, everyone else has this wonderful life, but I don't. 
So you don't have to follow that trend. But uh, working class, aristocracy, they always follow the class above. And the biggest thing that the working class has ever given the food industry, I would say it's good or bad, you decide for yourself, was convenience food, packed food, microwavable food, McDonald's, Ray Kroc. Huh? It was a system invented back then. I don't know, 1960s, 1970s, I forget. This guy, two brothers are friends, and then this guy, Ray Kroc, takes McDonald's from them. And everyone's like, what? You drove in, you got your food in less than a minute or two? Burger, fries, milkshake. Since the invention of McDonald's, health and waistline, diseases and waistlines in the Western world and now all over the world, globalization, direct correlation. Come on, though, will you feed McDonald's to your, you know, to, there was someone who's, it's, it's annoying. But it's part of our life. I'm not, I'm not saying it's evil. I love McDonald's. Once a week, I go to McDonald's. You want to try the best burger in McDonald's? For me, it's a quarter pounder with no ketchup, no mustard, extra pickles. <laughs> Solid. Solid. Crispy fries. Gotta have crispy fries. I love McDonald's. Chefs don't eat McDonald's. You said. Dude, after service, it's the best thing to eat. Right? But that's all I'm saying. It's for convenience. Uh, there's nothing good, nothing, nothing bad, nothing wrong with it. Definitely, there's no health benefits to eating fast food. Obviously, whole foods are always better. Uh, but hey, what am I going to say? Close McDonald's, lose, lose millions of jobs. And, and these jobs sometimes support families. No, I'm not, no I'm, not the, I'm not the person to say that. All right, so there's the working class, and then there's also the peasants. Uh, the peasants, the man, they are the ones who, you know, in the, back in the day, they, they made street food. And street food in Europe it doesn't come to the same esteem as street food in Asia. I guess it's a new mommy thing. Umami is the fifth taste. <laughs> fifth taste. Because uh, in our mouths, we have salt, sour, bitter, and sweet. And in the middle is umami. Tagalog, it's nam, nanam, malinam, nam. Mm. Toyo, kalamansi. Patis in your bulalo. Pow! Mind blown. Soy sauce, miso, and your Japanese food. Oh, wow. Sarap. Gugutom na kayo. Gugutom na rin ako eh. But anyway, street food. And it trickles down from royalty, aristocrats. There's this trends, you know, everyone's making trends. And the reason why I, that I introduce you to these four levels of society is they influence food. They're the ones that employ us. They're the ones that pay for the cuisine that you make or the content that you're peddling. So knowing which hierarchy of society you're catering to may be a good thing. Uh, it's very difficult to do royals now, but aristocrats, the peasants, you can. Uh, and the, the site guys, the way that people think is very different. Now let's talk about French influence in the culinary profession. Uh, you know, what is influence first and foremost, and why French? Uh, because what is influence? The influence is the capacity to have an effect on the character and development or behavior of someone or something. You know, or the effect itself. And the reason why the French had the most influence in culinary arts in the Western world is because of uh, two guys. Marie Antoine Carême is a guy. He was royalty chef. Back then, they made this elaborate big, like lechon. Every platter was lechon. Cakes that were so decorated, terrines, etc. And then next came uh, August Escoffier. It's like, dude, this is too much. No, let's, let's lighten things up. Lighten things up. And if you notice, uh, that's a trend. But uh, August Escoffier wrote a book of techniques. And what is technology? What is the definition of technology, madam? Some of you in the class, technology is a collection of its procedures, knowledge, science, gadgets. It doesn't have to be electronic. Cooking is technology. It's a procedure. There's a system to this. 
there's actual amounts. That's technology. Huh? If you get a franchise from abroad, when they teach you their recipes, they call it transfer of technology. That's the professional world jargon for that. No? It's also what is legally stipulated in the contract. Transfer of technology. So they invented the technology, which you will all, it's the reason why you go to school for culinary arts. What is a roux? What is a slurry? Why does it thicken? What temperature do I cook this to kill this bacteria? At what temperature do I cook that to make sure it's delicious? So that's what we will learn. It's about systemization. And I want to share with you everything that we teach you here. It's a system. So once you step into the kitchen or you start to re talk, we start to discuss matters of science, temperature, weights, conversions. Take note of it. Try to ask me questions and understand why, 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 how, why, why, how, 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 chef. How, how, how? Why, why, why? How, how, how? The carabao. <laughs> Couldn't resist, sorry. And then, um, so yeah. And lastly, why history? Why not history? Whose story is it anyway? You know, the wonderful thing about having chefs with experience is uh, get, make us piga for our experience. Diba? Make us piga. Sayang naman. Diba? All of this history of humanity can be lost. It's people like you who are hungry, hungry for the knowledge and experience and what you can do with it in the future that makes a difference in this world. So make us piga. Um, finally, almost finished. Uh, why? I'm going to make a segue to professionalism because our next talk will be about what is a professional. So. The reason why I started with the whole Garden of Eden thing and the whole serpent analogy is because I believe the serpent of any chef is unprofessionalism. Not just a chef, anyone who works commercially that gives something in exchange for cash, funds, money, that's a job, business, sales, dividends, value, that's commerce, right? Economics and commerce. So anyone, um, anyone that does that should always be aware of unprofessionalism. Professionalism maximizes your potential for success, whether or not you're a good cook or not. Yes, I said that. Not all of us will be great cooks. Some of us will be great vloggers, bakers. Some of us will suck at breads but be good at cakes. Some of us will be good at meats but can't make a cake to save our lives. It's me. I don't know how to make cakes. Uh, the reason why I say that, professionalism, is your guard. It's your guide. Yeah? It's how you operate. Most places, chefs, cruise ships, hotels, will hire a professional who is a mediocre cook versus the genius cook who is unprofessional. Success will never be sustained by an unprofessional genius cook. Never. I've heard so many stories. For a time, they will have their time in the spotlight. I'm not going to name names. I feel sorry for the person. I didn't say the gender. But there was a time. Always right. Always in the spotlight. Unprofessional. Did not know how to lead his team. Did not know how to talk well to her partners. <laughs> now no one wants to touch him or her before he if she or he wanted to put up something a restaurant or business dami nakalinya niya investors ngayon wala na kawawa siya I feel sorry for the person sometimes I want to see if I can give the person a chance but then if the mindset is not right the chance will be wasted diba? so mind you professionalism please if you stand for nothing, you will fall for anything. It is, it is our past that gives us value. I, want, I like this passage from the Bible. I'm a Bible geek, but I'm not religious. I just like history. I like Romans, I like Greeks, I like the Bible. And now I'm starting to like the Vikings. Netflix, kasi. Kasalanan ng Netflix yan. Diba? So for this reason, make every effort to add to your faith, goodness, and to your goodness, knowledge. And to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance. 
to perseverance, godliness, whatever you might think that is, to godliness, affection for each other, and to brotherly kindness, which is affection for each other. Uh, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, I love that word, increasing measure, professionalism. It's an increasing measure. You're never pro already. You're never good already. It's a measure that keeps increasing. Wow, it takes a load off me. That means every day I can get better or worse as long as I'm heading to the right direction. All right? Um, for you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. When we drop out of college, when we lose a job, when we fail in business. Failing in business can be the most productive thing of your life if you learn from it. But if you're ashamed of it, you hide it, you don't talk about it ever, you put it under the rug and want to forget it, what lesson did you waste? That was the experience of a lifetime. Yeah? Failure in life is the wonderfulest, wonderfulest, not a word, no, but the wonderfulest teachable moment. And life's like knocking on your head. Tuk, tuk, tuk. And you're like, mm. tick tock. Shut me. <laughs> All right? So last but not the least. Kanina ka pang last but not the least, last slide na talaga ito. Okay, a segue to professionalism. And I love this. You can Wikipedia it. It's called the Matthew Effect of Accumulated Advantage. It's from the Gospel, the Book of Matthew, who is anonymously written but attributed to the teachings of Matthew. Because back in the day, writing was a technology that coding is today. Not everyone knew how to write. It was oral tradition. Get this. I want to end with this. I love it. For to everyone who has... More will be given. I love that. And it will be given in huge abundance. Huge. But to him or her who has not, even what little you have will be taken away. What does that mean to you? Let's end that with that. To me, you know what it means? It's ignorance. That's why I love education. Okay? When you seek the knowledge, that's just the beginning, the knowledge. After knowledge, you have to understand it, right? Because if I tell you 2 plus 2 is 2, big deal. But if you understand math so much, guess what? You, you discover the law of velocity and flight, and airplanes are built because of math, which starts at 2 plus 2. Diba? From knowledge, then you get this understanding. So the analogy I'm using with food is now we're going to learn about knowledge of food, but then to understand it is something completely different. And to be able to apply it in a way that serves you and others, that's wisdom. And that, my class, is the end of lecture one. Any questions?